Welcome everyone to the MIT Global Innovators e-learning seminar series. My name is Andrew Nui. I'm from the MIT Bootcamps team. And today in this episode, we'll hear from Carlos, Frank, and Lauren, co-founders at Zelfa Health. And today they will be discussing how they've, unhand uh, they've handled uh, uncertainty in the launch of their healthcare startup. Um, and how they address the issues in the unpredictable and constantly evolving environment of entrepreneurship, both personally and professionally. So Frank, uh, Carlos, Frank and Lauren, uh, take it away. Hi, uh, welcome to Learn, Unlearn, Relearn uh, by the Zelfa Health team and in collaboration with the MIT Bootcamp. My name is Carlos Ator, I'm one of the founders of Zelfa Health, along with Lauren uh, and Frank. Uh, I am a, I'm a physician. Uh, Lauren is uh, helping out with the business development, and Frank is a data scientist and a software engineer. And uh, welcome. So I hope you learned some great things today. So today we'll primarily be talking about these topics. To go ahead and start this off, I wanted to talk about changing the phrase uh, one day into day one. Uh, this is something that's been deeply rooted within our team. Um, the moment that we have an idea, we try to execute it as fast as we can, um, not necessarily to um, exceed expe expectations, but in order to uh, fail fast and understand uh, what we learned from that and you know, really get stuff done. With that said, we, I will pass it on to Carlos to talk about uh, how we created a culture around that. So the best way to think about a culture is um, uh, it's a combination, especially in the company setting, is a culmination of the people, the, and the personalities they come with, uh, the environment in which they're working and in which they're solving the problem, and the solution that you're trying to provide, and uh, the nature in, in which that solution comes in. Um, so the culture specifically for us would be uh, built around a problem of uh, our vision being that we're trying to improve access to high quality medical care and resource poor environments. And in order to achieve that, we need uh, individuals who are competent in technology, medical, uh, medical informatics and things and business in order to carry out that vision. Um, so coming in, you would think, especially as we're working towards this, um, what would it take to kind of do that? Um, and you, I, and I would, looking back, I would recommend uh, not looking into trying to write a culture deck and a slide deck of what your culture should be, and then trying to kind of push people in that direction. But if you can get people to embrace and buy into the vision and get the right people who can work with each other and be productive in that environment, I think um, you'll learn that the culture will be evolving as the environment changes and as personnel changes. And even at some of the solutions that you're providing change, um, that, that will be uh, what would go about it. So I think it's okay to kind of have a rough idea from this initial standpoint of what your culture is. Uh, but uh, quite frankly, it's one of the most rapidly evolving things uh, in a business, and especially in our setting in, in global entrepreneurship. So one of the things that is key as a company evolves, you also want the product to evolve with it. And uh, initially we had some assumptions regarding uh, what the product would be and what key features would be important in the product. Um, and so as we set out to build these key features, we're taking, we started talking to customers. Initially when we listened to customers, we pretty much try to implement everything that they complained about into the product. But after we built the product, we showed them what mock up we built it, when we showed them a final uh, product to start playing with, um, the user experience was pretty cluttered. 
um, also uh, the customer was slowed down regarding their normal workflow. So we took a different approach in terms of how we collect customer feedback and we started focusing on patterns versus individual things they complain about. So one of the things that emerged around this and we started focusing on patterns is the customers complain, they're mostly complacent around the lack of control. Um, and so we started focusing on building tools that would allow them to customize the feedbacks and the interactions on our uh, product platform so that they can get the, the feel and the experience that they desire. Um, for example, people with different specialties, cardiology versus neurology and things like that. Um, and that actually started getting us more traction, better traction, and we actually started taking away features uh, to streamline the product, which actually enhance the user experience. So devolution of a model. This is an alternative to evolution of a model because it involves pre undoing a previously established uh, model. So as we came into the market, we came into the mindset that we're enterprise software as a service company uh, that would work in developing this solution for this market. With that, we came in with all the metrics, assumptions, and strategies of software as a service companies in the enterprise arena. Um, but as we came in, we uh, found out, you know, as a business model, you have your customers, your solution, and, uh, and your market. Um, and you, as you're trying to, uh, as, and as we came in, we, certain things required to be unlearned. First of all, in the healthcare space, even though you have a top-down scenario where you have the decision-making units of the hospital administrators, you also have a situation in healthcare where uh, physicians have an overwhelming uh, outsized influence on the decision makes being made as a healthcare organization. So in terms of uh, pitching and marketing and um, uh, the product, our market was fine because this is uh, still a resource scarce environment that has infrastructure capable of handling our solution and that needs our solution. But who we talk to about this primarily moved to from the decision making units that are purchasing uh, the product to the physicians. And in some aspects, it becomes more of a B2C rather than a B2B uh, um, um, uh, strategy, especially in the marketing standpoint. And that uh, 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 guides a lot of the messaging, a lot of the product development and, and, and uh, things like that. So we also learned in terms of the pricing and the payment models also make some adjustments to account for that. Uh, and so it has been interesting to relearn to uh, actually fit the model to the, to, the, to the market and the solution rather than the, the other way around. So that's been great. Uh, next. So in, uh, in tandem with that, um, one of the things that's really important and you know, you've alluded to it before is the concept of failing fast and rapid iteration. So um, our product, we've gone through countless iterations. I think right now we're probably on the third or fourth. Uh, every iteration, the goal is uh, basically you build, you present to the customer, you see their interactions, their feedbacks, um, you take their feedback and then you implement that feedback. Uh, one trend that's become noticeable is our product has become really simpler. Um, simpler, but a, a lot more customizability built, built into it. Um, and also one thing we optimize for is like uh, workflow, uh, making the workflow faster on it. And one key thing that's bec uh, that we've had to do is um, every time you present a mock-up to a customer, you should get different feedback versus providing them the end final thing. So when we are given the physical product, they usually have a different reaction from when they saw the mock-up. 
And that's been really key for us in terms of knowing which direction we want to move towards. Um, also, in addition to that, the team itself, we've had to test the team, um, put team members in different positions to see what the strengths and the weaknesses are. Um, and also, in addition to that, help with team chemistry. So utilizing pair programming so that you have a knowledge transfer, um, that has been really key. And throughout that process, our product quality and the quality of work overall delivered by the team has actually increased. So the same concept of iterating on your product, uh, we've transferred this same concept to the team concept and iterated on the team and seen who best fits where so that we can get a better quality and production over. So that actually leads into our team uh, building uh, concept. So when we first initially actually came, um, we started creating a team. One thing that we started, we were looking at when we were looking at the team was based on uh, university qualifications, degree requirements, experience, et cetera. Um, and we really, we focus uh, too much on the typical resume headlines like, you know, where have you worked, what university did you work on, what was your job title. And for us, we realized a lot of the cancel interview were not best prepared to actually contribute to us right off the bat. The skill set was not where we wanted the skill set to be. So we stopped focusing more on the headlines on the resume. And we just asked for, I mean, we, you can still send us your resume, but the thing that we're really interested in is a GitHub or a Bitbucket link or any code repo link that you have. So we just started asking, looking for code repos, example code repos, and we pretty much just went through code repos, looking at people's code repository to actually find out what that they're capable of. And um, in addition to that, we started, we started getting better candidates when we started looking at code repos. And then we got even better candidates with, with our job description. We actually provided tutorials uh, for to links, links to tutorials for the stack that we use. So um, that way they were, came in more prepared for our software stack. Um, and that yielded even better prepared candidates. And we translated that same process once we onboarded those candidates to building that, bringing that same concept in-house where you continuously learn. Um, we had code challenges, uh, pair programming, uh, sometimes uh, giving people features, small features of, um, to implement, um, even doing uh, weekly challenges on uh, some computational tasks, which were not really relevant to what we were doing in the product, but just to stretch goals. And that yielded better candidates in a short period of time. In a period of two months, you know, people with basic programming skills were able to run a whole service product on their own. So that concept of team development has actually yielded a much, much stronger product for us. So I man management leader of a boss. Uh, the way I look at it is a boss is, uh, uh, you know, it's, it's mostly comes down to what does work mean for the people who uh, come and join your company and try and help you uh, accomplish your mission. And in general, we, you know, work could be subsistence, you know, just a series of tasks in order to get you enough money to live. Uh, but work needs to be more than that. Work should be a way of self-actualization. Um, so the people who uh, join your team and try and help with your achieving your mission should be, uh, should be able to actually see themselves in the work that they are doing, see the work as a reflection of what they're doing. So one of the things that as we came in was uh, you do have top-down structures or uh, structures in management that are pretty much built in in terms of a hierarchical org chart. But the things that we needed that I, when we came in, especially for a startup, 
where you need to move fast, make quick decisions, and get to solutions very quickly was to reduce the communication overhead uh, by making a flat, flat stru structure in the management, by getting to uh, uh, incorporating a lot of management tools that uh, provide very, uh, very high resolution, quick uh, fit feedback loops on what the problem is, when it happens, and what the suggested solution is. And in building the team, it was we were able to kind of get to a better place in terms of uh, accomplishing some of the things that we need to do with a small team with a huge workload. Um, they said, if you want to go far, uh, go together. If you want to go fast, go alone. You certainly want to go far and fast. So we've managed to do it in a lean, uh, flat organization. And when we came into this, uh, this place with what we were thinking as a plan and things to do, I think Mike Tyson says, uh, uh, everybody has a plan uh, until you get punched in the face. Uh, and every, I think we, walk, we came in with the right mentality as a learning organization in order to uh, learn and adapt every time we get punched in the face so that we better at handling the punches and adjusting to them. So if you take away anything from this is, uh, just be ready to get punched in the face and uh, get back up again and uh, get going. Okay, so listening. Uh, criticism, criticism over compliments. So um, in the early stages of Zelfa, when we were getting out there, we were telling everyone what we were doing. Um, there was this disconnect because we were focusing on uh, resource poor areas and there was a lot of confusion with regulation and things of that sort and in the earlier days we would correct them and we learned that we learned from doing that that we just needed to let it go and actually listen uh to the feedback that we were getting because once we stopped and you know uh provided accurate information uh that opportunity for learning halted and so one way that we when a step further is um, when doing pitch competitions, it's it's a norm to one be confident and two it's all about speaking. But one thing that um, we came to learn and as a result started actually winning these competitions was pitching from the perspective of people um, in the audience. So after a pitch, I would listen. Um, to how people would describe the business back to me. And regardless of how um, accurate I felt that was um, in, in the scope of our words, I would pitch, I would pitch the, uh, I would pitch the feedback at the next competition. And this didn't only, you know, help us gain more traction by winning these pitch competitions, but it also helped us learn um, more about our startup in general. And it was really the, uh, the beginning of our company teaching us things. I can speak for all of us that we definitely were like, no, we cannot say that. And you know, we, we did and from that we've learned a lot. Going forward, um, learn, unlearn, relearn is really important to us, which is why it is the title of this webinar. And we think that uh, this is definitely the key to a growth mindset. And I just want to break that down um, further. So learn. The way we define this is uh, the ability to adapt and update to new information that you're, you're given. So this is the sense of being open-minded and you know, learning the new trends, seeing what else is out there. The second part is the unlearn phase, which is the, the most difficult to do because this is letting go of your old uh, paradigm any anything that you up until this point have believed to be true whether that's your business model whether that's something personal um, uninstalling uh, that that hardware from yourself which is way uh, easier said than done and so once you 
uninstalled that uh, software, it's relearning, um, adjusting accordingly to match either your own personal values or the new vi the uh, vision of the company um, in order to not only uh, stay competitive in markets, but also to be sustainable. Um, and with that said, we want to thank you for uh, having us and we're going to go ahead and open up the questions. Great. Thank you, Lauren, Frank, and Carlos. Um, I'd like to start off with um, Alfredo Santos. Um, let's see what he say. So he says, what is the biggest challenge when managing and being the leader of a healthcare SaaS company when, you know, some of you are not from a tech background, like being a doctor? Um, how, do you, how do you manage that from the healthcare professional side? Well, I, um, I guess I have, the, I have the good luck of having both, a, you know, s some tech background and, uh, and being a doctor, um, which, which helped quite a bit because I, I did some coding back when I was a lot younger. But um, I think, I think the, the biggest or the newest thing is just uh, this is the first company I'm the lead off. And, uh, um, but being a doctor, you leading a team, you're leading a team of nurses, uh, technicians and various other things, um, yeah, various other people in the team, in the healthcare team. And so there's a lot of leadership uh, instilled in that practice as just being a physician. Um, but in management, I think the biggest thing that helped was uh, uh, building management tools in, in the company in order to establish some feedback loops so that uh, you can react when things go wrong and when things go well, you can reinforce those things. Um, and then just making sure that um, everybody, you had the right person working on the right problem at the right time. And those, those things were some of the things we, as I worked on establishing early on were building tools to make those things happen. Great. Um, next question from Daiki. Can you uh, move specialized people or teams um, that you have worked with from before um, from one sort of uh, area of the you know, industry to another and to test if they are adaptable and flexible and able to also execute? Yeah, so um, that's actually a good question. Um, I think in, in, a, in a startup in general, um, even no matter how specialized somebody's at something, you want them to know more than one thing. And this is actually one of those things that I stole from sports. Um, I actually took it from a particular coach um, who lost in the Super Bowl. But um, it's something that actually works really well. <laughs> it was Andrew's live there. So uh, it, it, you never know when things arise. I mean, a startup, especially in startup business, things change so fast. There's so many different things that come up and you will probably spread really thin and you want to be confident at least one other thing. That way, if somebody who's normally competent in that field is tied up doing something else, you want to be able to at least handle it enough for them to come back and take it over. So even if it's something outside your field, like, you know, I'm technical background, but I was lucky enough to work, you know, in, um, as, as an analyst in the finance field, but I won't say I'm an expert. But at least, you know, pick something up or medical. I'm definitely not medical at all but learn and take it up that way. Um, if, if need arises, be able to take over or else I think you'll just be hamstringed as a company. Thank you for that, Frank. Um, Lauren and Carlos, do you have anything else to add? Because, you know, I think this really touches on a, a, a really good point of the team, which by the way, for everybody viewing in um, this, Thursday, we'll have another e-seminar on Teams. Um, but can you share a little bit about, you know, how, you know, in your journey as a startup, how have you had to work on parts of the project that 
uh, was not really in your area of expertise? Yeah, definitely in a startup, it's all hands on deck all the time. And you have to become um, an as needed expert whenever you had no prior experience. And that was definitely something new to me, um, especially if you, you know, you have a long career or anything like that. There's no, whatever box existed, it's gone. It's just open field and you just got to keep running and just contribute what you can to the team. And if you can't meet those deliverables, another portion is, uh, you know, be, being a sense of vulnerable to the team and telling them, Hey, I cannot deliver on this. And, um, being able to, you know, shift, shift the responsibility because if, if you fail to meet your deliverables, you're failing the team and failing your, your project startup, whatever it is you're working on. So, um, it really just, it was reading a lot and doing research, um, to meet our goals, like over and over and over. <laughs> cool. Great. So next question, uh, Ines asks, um, how do you lead your team when you aren't an expert on the industry? Uh, for example, I'm working on an app, but I'm not a programmer. How do I manage my lack of expertise on that specific field? That's the first part of the question. The next part of the question is, um, how do I do this without, um, you know, losing my employees respect for the work that I want to do? Hmm. Well, I, I guess the fact that she's actually starting uh, a company to work on an app means she's either um, passionate about a particular problem or uh, she, she has some knowledge about a particular field. Not knowing, well, not, not being a programmer is not, is not very different from not being a problem solver. So, so long as you're capable of actually delivering solutions to your team, delivering knowledge and information about your team to your team um, is very important. For example, um, Lauren is not a programmer, but you know, uh, and I'm, I'm, I don't do any uh, much, well, some, but not much programming at all. Uh, but it, it, every, you know, I guess being a medical team, you can also have, I do the data mapping and things like that. But it's very important to actually show that you bring, uh, to, for them to know that you bring value as a problem solver. Uh, because uh, programming, even for a tech startup, is probably 20% of the, of the, of the problem in any technology startup for sure. Thank you, Carlos. Um, next question from Giovanni. Uh, so he's asking in regards to the devolution of a model slide, um, can you provide an example on how your vision helped the company to lead or enhance the implementation of the model? I guess one of the advantages of being a uh, problem first company is like you we uh, our our mission is to increase uh, access to high quality healthcare and resource poor environments and this is a fundamental a very fundamental problem this is true today and this is true to in the future that there's always going to be places with few resources that need high quality healthcare um, I think if, uh, if you, by starting from the mission first, uh, it's easy to um, adjust whatever model meet, meets the right solution, creates the right solution uh, for the problem. Um, a practical example, for example, is a business model requires a market, uh, a solution, a problem and a solution. Um, and as I was describing earlier, in these markets that we are in, there's a large number of freelance physicians or um, who are not really attached to a hospital. And being that physicians are our primary users, but the decision-making units of the health, the administrators of these healthcare organizations, we basically have to market uh, to the physician as an individual in order to address the systemic problem of 
to the healthcare organization as a start. So um, that part kind of turns it on its head in some aspects we behave as a B2C rather than a B2B a company. And that was quite unexpected in what we, what we did, but we've been able to structure things in a way that I think we'll, we'll be able to mitigate that, um, that previous assumption. All right, moving on. Um, so Asmad was also asking, do you find the location difference of your co-founders a challenge and how do you manage it? Uh, we have very structured calls um, and we have figured out what time periods work for both of us um, or work for the whole team. And going from there, we just have stuck to um, a routine and you know, texting, emailing, um, we have different avenues for uh, level of priority that need to be addressed immediately. And from they from the minute that they flew off to Kenya, like we had that, uh, we already had a plan to to keep the doors open for communication. Right, and 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 so really, I think you know it's probably also worth mentioning that you know, like how did you guys. Um, form the team, how did you guys uh, start? Um, can you share a little bit about that story? Because um, people are also thinking along the lines of, okay, well, you guys are apart, but at the same time, did you have some sort of working together in the same location before that? And how did that work out? Yeah, I'll let Carlos go ahead and tell, tell our, our fairy tale startup story. Um, I guess, uh, we, we are based in Austin, um, uh, but we, I, we are, uh, mar our target markets are in developing regions. Um, we started based on a problem I observed during residency and, well, even before residency, I've been looking back to my emails and I've been probably describing this since 2006 to people. So um, it's just lack of information in healthcare organizations. So as I was getting through finishing my residency in, uh, in, in Austin, Texas, um, there were various paths I could have taken. Uh, one could be academia, one could be the non-governmental route. Um, and uh, the least likely route was entrepreneurship, uh, but it seemed to be providing a sustainable and uh, interesting, uh, like, so novel solution to a problem that I'd seen in health, lack of healthcare information. Um, so I tried, to, uh, I tried to recruit Frank, but he was working on another project. And so we started off working on, on this in terms of um, doing the primary market research, getting information. And I had a friend, Lauren, who was, uh, who was helping me with this. And so um, as soon as Frank became available, uh, I got me, me, Frank and Lauren uh, to form a company. Uh, the natural route would have been to get other physicians to join me in doing this, but we'd be basically the same skill set. And uh, knowing that I was, you know, I was a physician and also had a tech background, I think that was a good complementary. Frank had an experience with building very complex sy systems in the past, and that was really crucial for what we were doing. And so I think it all came together in terms of uh, a balance of skill sets in, uh, to make a great founding team. I'm kind of following like Bill Allett's like hipster, hustler, and like tech person too. Like we kind of uh, unintentionally followed that model. Okay, and um, so there are a few questions here that talk about um, your pro where, where you guys are, you know, you, you talked about um, it's founded and located in Austin, but you guys are also in, in Kenya. Um, and can you explain a little bit about why you're in Kenya? Um, have you, um, how did you manage to go from Austin to Kenya? Um, and then coming a little bit also there, coming back to the team, how do you manage team dynamics? Well, the, I'll, I'll answer the country part. Uh, we were actually born in Kenya. Um, 
uh, I, I think that would help, but we did a really thorough like uh, um, primary market re research in terms of identifying and segmenting the markets that would use our solution in terms of resource cars environment. So it was a balance of regulation, infrastructure, the ability to adopt technology and the lack of uh, the solution that we were providing and the need for the solution. So um, you whip that up into a, uh, an equation and it comes out that Kenya was one of the prime places to do it. So it was quite coincidental that we were actually from it and, um, and it's one of the uh, places that really needs what we're, we were providing. So. Yeah, uh, I think team dynamics, I think maybe Frank or Lauren will go. So it's about team dynamics. Yeah, I can, I can definitely talk to that uh, in terms of um, like, uh, he was alluding to like being related and how that informed. But everyone has different responsibilities. Um, so everyone has their domain and basically amongst the team, you just basically have people who run a certain domain and certain else. I mean, in a startup, there's so much stuff that goes on and there's so many things happen parallel that it's impossible for one person to have a say so and be in charge of everything. And if you're a control freak and you want to have it be in charge of everything, uh, you're going to burn out really fast. Uh, you probably won't even go like three months. <laughs> so uh, for your survival, your individual survival, just so that you can keep on living, be alive, um, it is crucial to just let go certain responsibilities and just uh, own up certain responsibilities. And I think your teammates, um, if they have any sanity, will appreciate that. And so then there are also questions. Have you raised uh, VC funding? No, we haven't. We haven't raised any VC funding. Uh, no, because, uh, well, we haven't because uh, we actually have a, run, a runway for about a year. Um, and I think some of the things because of the shifting stands of the environment in which we're working, we'll be in a stronger position in, in about six months to raise funding than we are now, uh, you know, just in terms of uh, having a proven product and a proven model it will, be, will be a better position. And we're just lucky enough to be able to do it uh, uh, without, without the need for uh, VC funding. But uh, I think that will be what will be going on this summer um, in terms of uh, uh, whipping that up and uh, getting that going. But, uh, so that's the strategy as of now. It's just placing ourselves in a better position for fundraising than, uh, than we are currently at. And primarily, a lot of VCs are not really familiar with the regions that we're working in. So, so it's, uh, it's uh, useful to do this first. And a follow-up question to that from Chara was, did you apply for any research funding or how, did, how do you guys finance this project from the start? Um, do you have, you know, financial partners or, you know, sort of friends and family? And yeah, I'd say uh, uh, friends and family and, uh, uh, and, uh, <laughs> being really early in cryptocurrency. That's uh, something else that happened. So that's, okay. that's how that happened. Right. Um, um, yeah. And then we'll get into the competitive analysis, uh, can, competitive landscape. Have uh, Lalif, I hope I'm pronouncing your name correctly, have established EHRs threaten your market. Um, how do you address competitive, uh, the competitive analysis? Yeah, so in terms of like um, competitors in the market, I think one of the things is to focus on, not necessarily focus on overall features, but user experience. Um, that's one thing that's been a differentiating factor with us. You know, sometimes when you talk to somebody over the phone, 
what we do. Like, yeah, you know, I think there's other people who do that. But then when they see the product, they're like, wow, this is really awesome. Um, I mean, we had a similar experience last week. We we're talking to a group of physicians and Monday morning, you know, it was a very adversarial um, engagement. But once they saw the product, um, they actually liked it and started offering suggestions or tweaks or things like that just because the user experience is far much better than anything they have right now. And then also another thing that we do, we are every week we're adding new features. So we're doing another release this Friday. Um, so we try to do at least uh, one feature, two feature releases every week um, and do a full product release every two weeks. So from a competitive standpoint, if your product is always improving, it's pretty much up to your competitors to catch up. Um, like the most of the year chars uh, were not were actually built elsewhere and brought in so there's always like trying to fit a solution to a problem uh, like you know like try to work up find a, a, a solution looking for a problem rather than the other way around so I think um, that's that's also helpful in from our standpoint so really what I'm hearing here is that you're taking your knowledge and your expertise and your, um, you know, you're embedded yourself in Kenya and really listening to um, what your customers and end users want on the ground and then iterating and evolving the idea, uh, the, the product and service to fit that rather than, you know, a lot of places cut and paste and try to squish it in. How do you understand the uh, decision making units and decision making process that you're actually as you're iterating and evolving so that you actually have paying customers? Right. So in in healthcare, it's still a very top down um, structure in most countries. Like I've I've worked in clinical systems in in not only in Africa, but in Southeast Asia and India, and, you know, in Latin America, and it's very similar. So the healthcare administrator is usually the decision making unit in a particular organization, be it a hospital, a clinic, a county, or a government. Um, but um, the one thing that's slightly different, and that's one of the things that we learned is that um, uh, as the end users, clinicians, especially physicians, are have a uh, oversized influence on the decision making unit, and so it's imperative to get the physicians on board as you're getting the clinical administrator on board. Uh, even uh, sometimes their interests might not align uh, in terms of uh, the administrator must be working on from a financial standpoint and the clinician will be working on a clinical standpoint, but also sometimes on a financial standpoint as well. So it's uh, based, uh, initially aligning the interests and making sure you find a language that appeals to, to both sides. Aaron is asking, if I'm working alone, um, how would I you know, figure out who's the perfect partner for me? How do you choose your team? Um, I think you talked a little bit about this earlier, but you know, I um, understand, uh, Carlos, you were you had already known Lauren, um, so that was a little bit easier, I guess. Can you share more? Um, right. So, I guess knowing who's who's the best person for a team would be one. Um, are they are they helpful? Do they bring skill sets that are helpful to accomp uh, accomplishing the mission or solving the problem and um, two, can you work to, well together? Like, you know, can you tolerate each other? Are they resilient uh, and they, are they reliable? Um, so the ability for them to work well together with you and then the ability for them to actually bring a useful skill set to the table that you can actually leverage and find useful are the two uh, 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 important things. And so if, if you work well together, uh, if, they're, if they have a great skill set, and if they, and they were also great if they're really passionate about the same problem, um, those 
those things will make, um, make them a great co-founder. Um, I think just to add to that, a good rule of thumb is if, if the shoe is on the other foot and they were asking you to be in their startup, would you, would you follow suit? Do you believe in them and whatever that may be, would you work under them or, you know, uh, decide to join their team? And I think if the answer is yes, there's a really good chance that that should be your co-founder. Um, just having that trust. And I think the establishment of a team that creates the team dynamics going forward. So it's super important. And a follow-up question to that, Ines continues to ask, um, how do you create a sense of belonging and commitment when there's very little incentive? Uh, sh she gives an example of like equity shares, for, for instance, are not offered. Um, so, you know, because as a startup team, do you, do you, do you pay your employees at this time? Um, how do you continue to motivate and engage them? Yeah, so like um, our team, like the engineering team, we have a, a like engineering team of uh, seven. And um, a lot of it is actually, it's a similar problem like in the States or most places where I've, I've been is people usually like look for something bigger than um, I guess like the compensation part. Um, so for us, one thing we do, I mean, there's a compensation, but then in addition to that is we grow. So we also, part of the rating is just not on work output, but how much have you grown? How much have you learned? And we always add challenges and pretty much everywhere in the world, everyone's just looking for a challenge and want to grow. They want to grow the skill set. They want to feel challenged. And then also there's a sense of responsibility we give people on our team. So everybody has a service they're responsible for. Um, they, we have events. So sometimes, you know, like um, after they finish initial release, we'll do a hackathon, we'll do a team building activity. And there's open sharing of information. So sometimes we even have weekly challenges, um, just different machine learning competitions. Because a lot of them haven't had um, the opportunity to practice data science. So that's one thing that, you know, we train them. Uh, some of like some things I've done in the past, giving some more projects and things like that. So I think it's, it's more than don't just focus on equity and pay compensation, motivate people. That actually, there's actually a book, uh, Clayton Christensen, he talks about how will we measure your life. It's actually a really good book. So I would highly recommend to you guys. But he talks about that very same problem because you'll always just have to pay more and more and more. You can't really help that. But I think you focus on skills that are transferable um, be much better off. You guys all came to the boot camp. How do you see, um, was the boot camp helpful in terms of your accelerating the innovation journey for you and also your startup? How did you see the difference uh, after the program? Um, definitely, like, first of all, you're surrounded by awesome individuals that um, are mission driven and they want to help out as much as they can. So immediately the day you step into boot camp, you have a network like no other, which is amazing. But not only that, um, the relationships that you, you obtain are actually, uh, they're more than just networking effects. Like these are people that you can call at like two, three in the morning. And we're talking about different time zones because, uh, you know, it was a global, boot camp and uh, you know just getting perspectives um, and they care they care about your success and it kind of feels like you just have this huge uh, like startup family to a certain extent that you can always just call just to talk to vent and the opportunities that have come from it um, have been incredible and just I mean from just needing a place to crash when you're in a different city to needing an introduction to someone at you know a fortune 500 company whatever it is um somebody in the boot camp is going to be there for you and it's not uh, particular to your class either you automatically have this uh this relationship with the whole uh, alumni 
No, absolutely. Like uh, it was great preparation, especially for us who are uh, technical and medical, you know, it was great preparation for entrepreneurship, a really solid foundation. And we learned a lot and not just the relationships, but a great educational experience as well. So um, like I, you know, that was, that was my uh, pocket uh, business school there. So it was big. Yeah. <laughs> And, and for everyone who is uh, listening, um, we are holding the first MIT Harvard Medical School um, Healthcare Innovation Bootcamp in August. I uh, want to thank uh, Carlos, Frank, and Lauren for um, sharing their insights on this call. And we hope you had a good time. Stay tuned. Uh, there are more uh, e-seminars coming up. Uh, if you haven't already registered for this Thursday, March 1st at 3 p.m. Eastern, um, we're going to be talking a lot more about team and how it's uh, people above product and it's really team above all else. Thank you again uh, from us at MIT Bootcamps and thank you to the alums at Z4 Health. Um, have a good day and uh, we'll see you soon. Bye for now. Yeah, thanks for having us. Yeah, thanks. Thank you.